Hi, and this is the Physics High Podcast. A quick quiz. Do you A, want to be inspired by science communicators? B, want to learn all about science education? C, want guidance on your scientific journey? Well, how about D, all the above? Today, my guest is Dr. Christine Lindstrom. Now, Christine is a physics educational researcher based at the School of Physics at the University of New South Wales, but here in Sydney. After she finished her PhD in Sydney, she returned to her country of birth, Norway, where she taught at a variety of universities, particularly in preparing pre-service teachers in physics. She also was a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Colorado, and she now, of course, is based here in Sydney. Apart from a passion in physics, she's also passionate about teacher education and particularly developing active teaching methods to raise student retention by developing pedagogically sound programs and resources. As a result, she is now also leading the team called Perfect at the University of New South Wales. That's basically the physics education research for evidence-centered learning. So let me introduce you to Christine as we hear what she's doing at the moment, what drives her passion for science and her views also on the importance of science education. Welcome, Christine. Thank you so much, Paul. Tell us a little bit about what you work on currently in terms of physics educational research, particularly in Perfect. So, yeah, as you mentioned, I lead the research in the group called Perfect and they We've got several things going on, but the two main projects that I am particularly passionate about at the moment are one focused on the introduction of student active teaching methods in university teaching. And the other is a project where we're looking into student knowledge of astronomical scale. To start off with the first one, I've been working with student active teaching methods for about 10 years now. I started, as you mentioned, when I was teaching pre-service science teachers in Norway. And there I was very, very fortunate to teach relatively small classes of up to about 30 future science teachers who not only were passionate about learning science, but also were passionate about learning good teaching methods. So when I started working at Oslo Oslo Metropolitan University, I developed two physics courses around what I knew was the best practice teaching methods that have come out from research being done in physics education research. So this basically meant that I designed the courses around what's known as the flipped classroom approach. Now, there are many misconceptions actually around what flipped classroom approach means. Very often people think that it means you have to watch the video before you come to class. Now, that's one way of doing it, but there are actually many more opportunities available. And the main point of a flipped classroom approach is that students get their first exposure to the material before they come to class so that they can really work through the material in their own time because people learn at different rates and people know different things from before. And then before coming to class, students also had to do a small pretest. Now, it was not really a test for marks, so it was quite easy to get marks. I just wanted them to do this test to really see what they had understood and what they were still struggling with. And then I would look through that pretest before class and then specifically tailor the instruction that I had developed for the class material so that we would be working actively on the things that students had struggled to learn on their own before class. So that's the basic idea behind the flipped classroom approach. Now, I did teaching and also research on this methodology for several years when I was in Norway. And so when I moved back to Sydney a couple of years ago, it wasn't really a question of how I would approach my physics teaching at the University of New South Wales, because the research evidence behind this methodology is very, very strong. And also it just makes teaching so much more enjoyable because when we are together in the classroom, it means that I have the opportunity to really work with the students and have a dialogue 
and focus on the things they need my help with. So I've done that for a couple of years and it's worked so well that I now have colleagues who want to use this method as well. So I also get to help colleagues in developing their teaching. Have you um, experienced a, a resistance at all to educators wanting to take up this approach? I would imagine that uh, the traditional teacher would be concerned about not covering the content uh, in terms of in-classroom allowing the students open. You say that there's a very strong research background and I, and I agree with you, but I wonder in my own personal experience with uh, educators, there seems to be a little uh, some resistance. Have you encountered that? And what's your um, response to that? So, yeah, I think anyone who has tried out relatively new teaching methods have encountered resistance. Now, I have two responses to that. The first one is you don't actually have to cut content at all because students get their first exposure to all the content before they even come to class with me. So the content is still the same. It's just we have changed what happens when. So instead of me delivering the content and the students having to listen in class and then they have to go home and work with the material and then not have any help when they're sitting there struggling with what's really going on here, we just flip it around. So they get the first exposure before they come to class and if there's some things they don't understand, not a problem. They just tell me in the pre-lecture quiz. And then when we come to class, anything that they've understood on their own, well, they don't need me to repeat that. And then we have even more time in class when we're together to work on the really tricky bits where I am the most useful to them. That's one side of it. And then the other side is I'm a researcher. I let the, I let the data speak. So I collect research data, and if people argue that this is a less effective method or whatever argument they might have, I say, well, look, here's my research data. If you have a method that works even better, then show me your research data, and if your data is stronger than mine, then I will concede that your way is better. But this is not about arguing based on gut instinct. This is science. So I'm going to ask two questions that you might come across uh, that may be a question that a teacher says, oh, I want to do this, but... So question number one is, what if students don't do the pre-watching, the pre-preparing, and they come to class totally unprepared? Ah, so this happens. And, and look, there's a, there's a bit of a give and take here because I understand that sometimes... Life gets overwhelming. You don't have time to do everything that you want to do. And that might be the reason why some students come unprepared. So I don't penalize students for not doing everything I would like them to do. At the same time, we are together in a course to help students learn. And that means that there is a certain responsibility on their part to actually come prepared. So the way that I usually engineer this is that I make sure that if you have not prepared, so if the student has not done their part of the job, they're not actually going to get quite as much out of us being together because then that, that, that then applies a bit of a social pressure to want to come prepared so that the time that you spend in class is actually useful. Second, my second question is, being that cautious teacher, is like, this flip approach sounds like increasing my workload. We all want our best for our students, but I only have so many hours in a day and I teach six or seven classes. How labor intensive is flipped, uh, a flip process? That is an excellent question and a perfectly valid question that I get, get offered quite a lot. So I have two answers to that because if you have a traditional approach to teaching that you have been using for a long time and your whole course is designed around that, then changing the approach is going to require some effort in the change process. However, once you have gone through that change process, then it's no different to 
any other teaching approach where you have your system, you know what you do, and you've also designed it so that it's not going to be overly labor intensive. Now, I actually did work with a year eight teacher a few years back, or rather I had a master's student who was in fact looking into whether flipped classroom was a good approach to use in year eight, because very little research has been done on whether this is an effective approach below around year 10. And this was the first year the year eight teacher was teaching. And as you know, the first year you teach a course is always a lot of work because you're building up the whole course. And what the teacher found was actually that it was no more work beginning a course, designing it as a flipped classroom course, compared to designing it as a traditional course. And in fact, she felt like it was less effort because she enjoyed the process more since she had that opportunity to get feedback from students every time and really hear what they wanted her help with and what they were curious about and also, you know, how, what they thought about the subject. Now, you're also uh, doing some work as well in some other aspects as well, not only flipped learning. Tell us a little bit about the wonder questions that you have uh, developed in terms of uh, increasing engagement with your students. Yeah, so wonder questions actually came out of my work on flipped classroom. And it was because the I wanted to make sure that the pre-test students did before coming to class was both useful for them as a learning tool, but also for me to understand not just what they were finding difficult and wanted my help with, but also what they were really curious about. Because learning is so much more enjoyable and easy to put effort into if you're interested. So I developed what I call a wonder question, which is basically asking the students to write a question about anything they might wonder about after having done the pre-work. So it has to be related to the pre-work, but not necessarily covered by it. And in seeing their wonder questions, I got an opportunity to delve into their curiosity, to their level of understanding, and also to see if they had any misconceptions that maybe I needed to address in class. So moving on a little bit about you, tell us a little bit about what got you interested in science in the first place. I mean, clearly you were interested in science before you started going down the road of science educational research. What, what drives your interest in science? Oh, it started very, very early. In fact, it's one of my earliest memories. So as you mentioned, I grew up in Norway. And my grandparents had a cabin up in the Norwegian mountains, far away from any electricity grids. So during winter, given that in summer, it doesn't actually get dark, so you can't see any stars. But in winter, I would go out on the veranda with my grandfather and he would tell me about the night sky, about the stars and the constellations and planets and the moon. And that's when I fell in love with astronomy. And that love actually stayed with me for, well, until today. So you then obviously decided to follow science at, uh, at high school and continue to drive your passion. And then you decided, I'm gonna pursue it on the other side of the world. What, how did that happen? <laughs> I can actually tie that with, again, with my passion for astronomy. Because I was so passionate about astronomy, when I was probably around 14, I joined an amateur astronomy club in my town and I bought a sizable telescope and I would go outside and use my telescope whenever the sky was clear in the evenings. But this being Norway in winter, I had never experienced in Norway that you could be outside looking at the stars without also freezing your fingers off. And all those hours trying to twiddle these knobs on my telescope and having the mittens on and then taking them off for a, you know, a few seconds to twiddle the knobs and then putting them back on and then my finger's not working. I had this, 
idea that wouldn't it be amazing to be able to look at the stars without being super cold in the process. So uh, I, I did the International Baccalaureate uh, in year 11 and 12. Uh, so some of your students might be familiar with that. But when you grow up in a non-English speaking country, doing the IB means that you do senior high school in a different language to your own. And that was quite a challenge at the beginning. But after two years, my English had become good enough that I was comfortable with conversing in English. And that was quite an amazing experience because it opened up the world in a way that I had never really thought of before. Because now I wasn't scared of going to a country where they didn't speak Norwegian. And because I thoroughly loved doing the IB, I learned so much. I thought I want to go to a place to study that has a similar approach to education as what they did in the IB. And I mean, I knew English. I didn't know French or, or German all that well. So I thought, okay, English speaking world, where can I go? Well, Canada was too cold. England was too cold. Um, the US was had, had slightly more expensive universities and, and sounded a, a little scary. Um, South Africa, my dad thought, sounded a bit too scary. New Zealand was also too cold. And so, you know, it was Australia by elimination. And I chose Sydney, um, actually mostly because I'd heard of it. I thought, I grew up in a small town. I thought, wow, wouldn't it be amazing to live in a city that people have heard of? That's, <laughs> that's how much my thinking has changed. That, that's how I thought when I was in high school. Now, which campus? I went to the University of Sydney. Okay. And so you sat under people like Geraint Lewis to basically get your astronomy kick? Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, I had a, a Geraint for my general relativity course in honours and I absolutely loved it. Now, you then had the opportunity to do your PhD. I did my, my PhD in the School of Physics. Uh, and my research project was on physics education research. And then after that, you became a Fulbright Scholar to the University of Colorado. How did that come about? So after I finished my PhD, I had lived out of Norway for eight years and I hadn't seen my parents as much as I would have liked. So I thought it was a good opportunity to move back to Norway and get to spend some more time with close family and friends and started teaching pre-service science teachers and doing this work on flipped classroom, which was both my teaching and my research. Now, there was a, a colleague of mine who was also who was in science teacher education in Oslo, and she was of American heritage and said, look, Christine, what you do is, you know, it's interesting work and you might enjoy having an opportunity to be with a larger community of people who do your kind of work because there weren't many physics education researchers in Norway. So she was the one who encouraged me to apply for a Fulbright scholar position. And I was very lucky to get it. In fact, I remember I was, of all things, I was in Beijing on my way to Australia when I got the email that told me I had been successful in my application. Yeah, that gave me the opportunity to go to the University of Colorado for a year. University of Colorado, of course, as probably many of our listeners know, is a fantastic place for physics educational research. And for those who are physics educators, will know of the FET team, uh, the uh, animations that are produced there. Tell me what you did as a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Colorado. So being in Colorado was absolutely wonderful. They have possibly the largest and most dynamic group of physics education researchers in the world, to the extent that they occupy two whole floors of the physics building. So the FET team occupies one floor, and then the physics education researchers who don't work on FET, they are on another floor. So I was on this other floor. And I was working with a team that is focusing on how to develop good experimental labs for higher year physics. 
because in physics education research, most of the work is done on first year physics, but there's an increasing number of people in the US now who are working on high year physics. And so I was really excited to be part of, of that group working on high year physics labs. And it just so happens that this year I was made the director of high year studies at the University of New South Wales in physics, which now gives me the opportunity to really draw on what I learned from working with the research group in Colorado and see what I can do with the high year labs at, uh, in our school of physics. Why do you like physics education research? Oh, because I'm insatiably curious. I love learning physics myself and I've always reflected on, on how I learn and what I see around me. And I was curious about why my teachers did what they did. And so when I got into a position of being able to start teaching myself, I realized that I wasn't entirely sure what the best way to teach was. And so that's when I had to turn to research, both reading the literature, but it wasn't always obvious how that literature translated to the particular context I was in. So then I thought, well, I guess I just have to scientifically test it out. I try two different things and I measure the impact they have. And then I choose the one that works the best. And there's just so many questions to ask about what works best when it comes to physics teaching. So I'm never going to run out of questions to research, that's for sure. My next question, I guess, is why is physics education or research so important? I'm not going to claim that it's more important than any of the other sciences. Of course not. But, but physics is well known for having several concepts that are quite challenging to get your head around. And this was originally unveiled on quite a large scale in the 80s and 90s uh, with some of the, the early work done in physics education research. So there are some researchers who developed what's known as a physics concept inventory that revealed that students, even at the most prestigious universities such as Harvard, were having trouble answering what many physics professors considered to be extremely basic questions about mechanics. So students could do all these fancy mathematical problems, but ask them a very basic question about how a package that falls out of a plane moves through, through the air, and students were stumped. And because physicists are very sort of scientific data-driven people, once they saw this data, they were flabbergasted. And many people were then kicked into action thinking, well, clearly what we're doing isn't working. So we've got to change how we teach these students. And that was really one of the most important things to happen in physics education research to kick off the research field in, in a massive way. And that's also where student active learning really grew out of. A well-known test that I assume came out of that, the force concept inventory came out of uh, that aspect of that research. Is that correct? Yeah, so it was precisely the force concept inventory that was the first diagnostic test um, that was used on a large scale to reveal these misconceptions that university students and, and high school students were having. One could argue, and I, I don't agree with this, of course, but one could argue those little details wouldn't make a big difference in the end. Uh, what would, would you respond with that? So I would disagree with your use of the words little details, because what this test was probing was nothing like the little details. It was the heart of Newtonian understanding. And if you don't understand the key concepts, such as the first and second law, then you can't really say that you understand mechanics. It reverberates through not just mechanics, but almost all other areas of physics because Newtonian mechanics is such a fundamental part of physics. Yeah. 
you uh, undermine the foundation of a building, then the whole building will collapse like a house of cards. Exactly. In terms of uh, science communication, how do you see yourself as a science communicator? Why is science communication important to you? So as a physics educator, um, I certainly see myself as a science communicator. And to me, what is most important about science education is to instill a certain way of thinking. So it's less important what the particular content is. And it's more about how you approach the world with your thinking, how you make decisions, how you form opinions, that you base that on evidence and logical reasoning, and that you're willing to be proven wrong. And that... I believe has a lot to offer in terms of how we progress as a society. Mm -hmm. And while I think of myself as a formal science educator and science communicator, it's often easy for people to make a distinction between those who are, have a formal role in it and then everybody else. Whereas really, we all play a part. So students who are studying science, they may not have a formal, formal um, role yet, but if you understand some science and you use that type of thinking, then when you talk to family or friends or your classmates, if you demonstrate and encourage others to use that scientific thinking in how you approach not just science but many different things in life then you are also doing science communication and you are playing a role so my next question is i guess an opportunity for you to offer some advice and i want to actually target two groups so the first is the students and the seconds are, are the educators. So let's deal with students first. Let's say we have a student who's interested in exploring science as a career or at least as further study at university. What advice would you give them? That, that is a difficult one um, for many reasons. One is that I didn't even know when I was in high school that the job I now have existed. I had never heard of physics education research. So I guess my advice would be to not look too far ahead and set your sights on a particular career, but rather recognize that you have an interest and passion for something and use that as fuel to learn as much as you can and enjoy the learning process. Because in that learning process, you pick up a lot of valuable knowledge that you can use in so many different areas later on. So that's one. And then the next is to, to be open, to listen to opportunities, and then ask yourself, even if there's an opportunity that may sound a bit odd or you didn't know it existed, maybe that is the right thing for you. And so gaining some self-knowledge, getting to know yourself and understanding why you are interested in science and how you want to contribute to the world, then those are actually more important questions to find answers to than just, well, what kind of science job do I want? Now let's return our attention to any educators who are watching this, teachers of physics specifically, what encouragement would you give them as they continue to teach students for physics? I think I would turn around and take the opportunity to ask them what keeps them in their jobs. Because being a physics teacher is it's incredibly demanding. And I have so much respect for anyone who is a physics teacher at all levels out there. I've had the pleasure of educating several current physics teachers and I gained so much from talking to them and understanding what it is that drives them and what it is that they see is driving their students. Because I don't have contact 
uh, very much at all with uh, primary school students, high school students. Um, but obviously the students that I teach at university, they come from that system. And the better I understand the system and all the people in the system, the better I can do my job of teaching and motivating the next generation. So, yeah, I think I would gain more than they would out of that conversation. <laughs> so we come to our last question, Christine, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to share a little bit about what you're nerding about. If you were in mixed company, this is something that you can't wait to talk about because it's something that uh, you're really interested in at the moment. And I'm giving you an opportunity to teach us something that we don't know. What would you like to share with us? So yeah, ner nerding out is the right word because this is not what everybody else nerds out about. <laughs> but I, I, <laughs> I have actually become really, really interested in leadership and systems in the last few years. Because as I progress in my job, I get more and more responsibilities in terms of leaderships, of leaderships of, of classrooms, of um, designing new courses, of supporting other people in changing their teaching. And now as the high year director, I also want to do a good job in a leadership position. And it's really made me question what it means to be a good leader and what leadership really means. So thinking back on when I was a high school student, I never realized how influential I was when I was a student. I always thought that, oh, I'm, I am just a student. I am just here to learn what the teacher tells me. And in a sense, whether I'm here or not doesn't really matter. But now that I have been a teacher for a long time and I, I teach big classes, I teach little classes, I really see how much influence every single student has in terms of what they are bringing to the classroom or more generally what I call the system. And I try to, to talk to my students and encourage them to contribute to this learning system in a more aware way, to know that them being there actually really matters. And if they think that I do something that may not have been great, they feel it should have been done better. I'm totally on board with listening to that feedback, but to make it more productive for all of us, I actually need them to help me to figure out, okay, how can we make this system better so that it's better for everyone, for all the students and for me. And even though I am calling the shots and then making the decisions in the end, it is very much a process that needs the inclusion of all involved. And having that experience with the classroom, I then look at society as a whole and you see these systems everywhere. The people who, who lead a society and how they need us as citizens to recognise that yeah, we too, we play a role and we need to not forget that. I think what this has led me to is the conclusion that we all need to ask, how can we be a source of positivity and improvement in all the, all the systems and groups that we are in? Can you give us a, a, an example that would really highlight what you're talking about? One, I mean, one example from my teaching is, is how I always ask students to tell me something that was something that was difficult, something that maybe you know didn't explain well enough, or give me feedback on assessments. Do you think that assessments aren't set in stone? They are something a teacher designs to try to figure out what a student learns. And some assessments are well designed and others aren't necessarily serving the purpose that they're intended to serve. And so if students give me feedback and say, look, this assessment, you know, I feel like I'm not 
able to show you what I know through this assessment, then I might have a chat with them and we can, might figure out how we can change that assessment so that it both helps the students show me what they know uh, while it's also fair for everyone involved. So um, in closing, if teachers want to get more information about flipping their classroom and also with the wonder questions and the other stuff to do, obviously they, we can go to the perfect website and I'll put that in the description of this video uh, and also on my website. Uh, are there other resources that you would encourage educators to look at that would give them uh, some more resources on, on what you're doing? I try to put everything that we do in perfect uh, onto that website so that we do have a one-stop shop. Excellent. So to avoid having lots of things to keep track of and say, go there. Well, thanks very much, Christine. I really appreciate your time and take care. Thank you so much, Paul. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe to get notifications of up and coming interviews as well as my other physics concepts. My name is Paul from Physics High. Till next time.